they were separated unto the tabernacle. The Lord was their inheritance. And so Paul was separated unto the gospel, like, much like the Levites were. Paul talked about the, the, uh, the soldier that didn't get him, he didn't get himself entangled in the affairs of this life because he was enlisted as a soldier. So he wanted to please the captain that enlisted him as a soldier. Paul was separated. He didn't, he didn't get himself entangled. In fact, he was, a, he was a master of unentangling from the things of the world. He was separated to the gospel. Some, somebody will probably say, well, he was a tent maker. Well, his tent making was an interest of the gospel. Paul is the one that said, they who minister the gospel should live of the gospel. And he said, it's not, you've partaken of my spiritual things, he told one of the churches. It was not too much that I partake of your carnal things. And so he made, he made tents in the interest of his ministry for the gospel. The tent making was a sideline, not preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel was the main thing. Another thing Paul said about this ministry of the gospel, Philippians 1.17, he said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. The gospel does have enemies. Some enemies are seen, some enemies are, 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 are not so obvious, but the gospel has enemies. Now, Paul saying, I'm put in, set for the defense of the gospel, is not to say that, that the enemy can actually destroy the gospel. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's not saying uh, that, that if I didn't preach the gospel, then the gospel would, would just uh, go, go extinct. That's, that's not Paul's defense of the gospel. But here, here's the sense in which Paul was, the, was set for the defense of the gospel is that some, there would be some that would pervert the gospel, make the gospel into something that it's not. And Paul was set to answer that perversion of the gospel. Some would turn the grace of God into a license to sin. Paul could, he could, so to speak, he could read minds. He, he would say, now, I, I know what you're saying. He, some of you are thinking that because grace much more abounded than sin, then we should say, let us sin, that grace may abound, right? And Paul answered that. See, he was defending the gospel. He was set for the defense of the gospel. Some would add to the gospel. Some would preach another gospel. Paul defended the gospel. Another reason that Paul preached the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, he was put in trust with the gospel. You ever think about God trusting a man? We think about uh, men trusting God. But here, Paul was entrusted with the gospel. God gave him a work to do. God enabled him to do the work. God was entrusting Paul with the gospel. He was sent to the Gentiles. I'm, God, I'm glad God entrusted Paul with the, with the gospel because the Gentiles got in. That's us. And largely due to Paul's preaching, to Paul's ministry. He, he fulfilled the ministry. Like Joseph was appointed over the land, jo, uh, Paul was appointed over this gospel, and Joseph was faithful, Paul was faithful. Amen. We can be faithful too. So as a wise master builder, the gospel was Paul's tool set. Paul borrowed nothing from the world, nothing from the wisdom of men. Paul's manners, Paul's knowledge, Paul's weapons, Paul's message, Paul's wisdom, they all sourced from the gospel. And he preached the gospel to the church. Now Paul had to answer some, some lies and some objections. I think every generation in this world is tasked with some uh, with some work like that. And so, like I mentioned from the book of Romans, Paul answered an objection to the people ha that the people had. And so it's common in churches today to do recruitment work, but they're really just recruiting to have more people do the recruiting work. You know, bring them in, and then you just turn them right back around and make them do what just, you know, recruited to recruit, save to save, won to win. That's a common approach today in the church. So the, all the focus is on the unconverted. Now we're, we're glad that the gospel goes into all the world. I'm not against evangelism. What I'm talking about here is the emphasis of preaching the gospel to the church. And that is when they come in, you gotta give them something to eat. Just like Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, he said, give her something to eat. He didn't say, now that you're, now that you're raised from the dead, go raise somebody else from the dead. No, he's give her something to eat. So consequently, some people are brought in and then starved. Some people are brought in and then malnourished. Some people are brought in, and I, I say brought in in quotes, brought in and then neglected. But Jesus, John the Apostle saw, Jesus is currently in the midst of the churches. He's ministering to the churches in the midst of the church. He's encouraging the church and rebuking the church. He's delivering promises to the church. He's making himself known to the church. Jesus is ministering to the church. Conversion is actually the commencement of the work in you and I. Conversion is not the end of the work. 
It's like the work can really begin now that you're in. Now the work can really begin. I find it amazing that we have, that we have to defend things like this. So Paul actually, he had the mind of Christ. When he set to preach the, the gospel to the church, he had the mind of Christ in that. Jesus is ministering to the church as the head. So Paul was putting his hand on the plow of the kingdom in preaching the gospel to the church. This is a, this is a kingdom plow that Paul's got his hands on of preaching the, king, the gospel to the church. Paul's determination to preach the gospel to the church was not at the expense of the, of the particular needs of the church. It's not that Paul was saying, I, I don't want to see what's going on. I'm just going to preach the gospel, and then I'll be gone. That's, that wasn't Paul's, Paul's approach to the ministry at, at, at all. In fact, the gospel does address every human condition. The gospel is not a, not, a, not a niche of the kingdom. The gospel is the message of, in fact, it's called the gospel of the kingdom of God. It addresses every need. And, in fact, there is no intermediate message needed before the gospel is heard. And so you know, Paul preached the gospel to the Corinthians. It's been mentioned this week already how the, what, a, what a messy condition existed at Corinth. Well, how, how's Paul going to address all these conditions? Well, he did it this way. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He addressed all these conditions with the gospel. It was the gospel message. He preached the gospel to the Galatians. They had been, they had been bewitched. That's a strong word. They'd been bewitched. In fact, he said, you've fallen from grace. If you're trusting in the law, you've fallen from grace. That's a hard word. So how did Paul deal with this? He says, God justifies the heathen through faith. No matter what the condition, Paul addressed it with the gospel. Peter did the same thing. Peter wrote to people who were in danger of false teachers and a false doctrine. Of damnable heresies, Peter said. What are we going to say about this condition? He says, he, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. That's, that's how Paul addressed the condition. He preached the gospel. John did the same thing. He preached the gospel to the brethren. What about the, the Antichrist is already in the world? That kind of message scares some people to death. The, anti, the Antichrist is already in the world. I'll let you in on the secret. The Antichrist is already in the world. So what's, what's John going to say to this condition? He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That, that's what we're going to say about that. So Paul, the, the apostles are not ignoring the condition of the churches and just saying, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear, I don't want to know. I'm just going to preach the gospel. No, the, the gospel is what addresses all of these conditions. Amen. So we need a powerful affirmation of the gospel. The gospel is the report of what God has done for the human race. The gospel is not just about possibilities. The gospel is about a work that is done. It's been accomplished. Sin has been atoned for. Peace has been made. The devil has, his head has been bruised. The Holy Spirit has been given. It's a message of what the Lord will do in wrapping up his purpose in, in the earth. See, the preaching of the gospel is not limited to that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus rose. That's the foundation of the gospel. But what do you do with a foundation? You build on it. And so the, these three facts are not the totality of the gospel. They are the foundation of the gospel. To, to, some, to some men, the gospel is just telling people Jesus died for you, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. But that's, the, that's like the beginning of the gospel. That's the cornerstone of the gospel. And God's building a temple. He's building such a temple that he himself is going to dwell in it. So the gospel is not, is not just that Jesus died, buried, and rose again, but it's also the glory that would follow. Remember Peter talking about the message of the prophets? He says the sufferings that he would accomplish and the glory that would follow. So when we talk about the, the gospel, we're talking about the glory that, that is following, that's resulting from the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the glory that would follow. It's like what grows from the seed. It's not just the seed. We don't plant seed for the seed's sake. We plant the seed for what grows from the seed. The, if we're talking about the, re, the re effects of his, of his resurrection. Think about it this way. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Isn't that gospel? That's good news. That's part of the gospel. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He flees because Jesus died, because he was buried, and because he rose again. The, God, the, the devil's not scared of any man. He's not going to flee because he's intimidated by you or by me. He flees because you resist in the Lord. 
That's who he flees from. What about your confession of sin? Well, God forgives our confession of sin because Jesus died, because he was buried, and because he rose again. So you see, that's the glory that would follow, is that you can come to God and be received. You can go to bed every night with a clean conscience. You can confess your sin, God's faithful and just, to forgive you of your sin, that's gospel. You can fear not him that kills the body. That's because Jesus holds the keys of hell and of death. You can fear not what men can do unto you. See, that's, that's glory. That's glory that's followed the, the death, burial, and resurrection. And we can mortify the deeds of our body. Why? Because we've been planted together with him in his death. His death is the one that, has, that counts. Now we can mortify the deeds of our body. So herein is another parable about the preaching of the gospel. The Levites had to keep those coals burning that God lit. You remember they were, they were trekking all through, the, all through the wilderness and they had to tear the tabernacle down and set the tabernacle up whenever the cloud moved, whenever the pillar of fire moved, and they had to keep those coals that God had lit, they had to keep them burning. That's like the gospel. We gotta keep the gospel burning. I'm not saying it totally depends on us. I'm saying we're working with what God lit. We're working with, the, with what God gave and we're preaching the gospel uh, to, to the church. So to be convinced that the church doesn't need the gospel is to have the wrong church and I'd say the wrong gospel. <clears throat> now Paul said in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, he said, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I think if it had determined, if it had depended on man to be the architect and the engineer of salvation, then somebody would have decided that all men needed to see Jesus rise from the dead, but nobody did. God hid it. He raised him from the dead, but no man saw him rise from the dead. Now, I understand that some men saw him. He, he showed himself to some brethren after he rose from the dead, but I mean, nobody saw him come out of the grave, but we preach that Jesus rose from the dead, and the preaching of the resurrection is more powerful than, the, than if you had seen him rise from the dead. It's by the foolishness of preaching. Somebody said already this week that the testimony of what God's done is more powerful than, than if you were to see it. <clears throat> so preaching actually has been given a lot of bad press. Preaching has been, has been reduced to something that's just correctional. Like when the people say, I, I don't want to preach at them. Well, we do want to preach at them. But what they mean is, I don't want to just tell them that they're doing everything wrong. You see, the, the, the meaning of preach has actually been changed. That it's just intended to, to point out people's faults. You know, step on toes. That's almost holy language to some people. Ooh, got my toes stepped on today. I don't feel like I've been to church unless I have my toes stepped on. Well, that, that's, not, that's not the essence of, of preaching. If there's blame to be laid, then blame needs to be laid. But, that, but the, the gospel is so much bigger than just laying blame. The gospel is about taking away blame. Man, man has largely become the subject of preaching. Your dreams, your life, your struggles, your, 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 your. Pre preaching's about the man, not man. Preaching's about the man. So preaching has fallen on hard times, if I can say it like that. To some people, preaching is just no more than motivational speaking. It's just to, just to kind of pump it up, just to get it, just to, uh, just to get excited. Listen, brethren, if, the God, if what is preached can be obtained somewhere else without having Jesus, then it's not the gospel that's being preached. <clears throat> the gospel is unique to Jesus. In fact, everything that Jesus does is unique to Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's preaching the God. He gives the gospel. He's the messenger of the covenant. He doesn't share glory with, with anyone else. Like, remember the Egyptians? They, they duplicated some of the, the, uh, the things that Moses did there in Egypt, and then it got to a point where magicians were like, hands off. This is the finger of God. Man, I can't reproduce that. I can't duplicate that. This is the finger of God. That's what we say about the gospel is more than the finger of God. It's the right arm. It's the whole arm that took to, a, to bring salvation to, to himself. So preaching, in a way, has been hijacked to be something that it's not. But actually, Paul said that it would be. He said that people would gather to themselves, uh, preachers, to, to preach things that they're itching ears, having itching ears. They would gather to themselves things, uh, people to say things that they want, they want said. So what should we say to this? Well, an, an, enemy, an enemy has done this. Jesus was appointed and anointed to preach good tidings. 
and those he sends are also anointed to preach good tidings. Jesus brought a message. Jesus did a lot of work, but he brought a message about the work that he did. He brought a message of unseen things. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That couldn't be perceived with these eyes. It had to be through a message. He said, if any man drink of the water that I give him, he'll never thirst. Nobody could find that out. Nobody stumbled on that and said, look at this. This is water that if you drink, you'll never thirst again. If you found it, it's because it, it was shown to you. If you found this water that you drink and you never thirst again, it's because it was preached to you. It was proclaimed to you. Jesus brought the message of the gospel. He said, he that believeth on me will never die. Do you believe this? Even if he dies, yet shall he live. He had to, he had to preach that in a message because it didn't appear. It wasn't obvious that these things are so. That, so it was brought to us in a message. In fact, everything that Jesus did supported what he said. All the miracles had a message in them. Everything he did supported what he said. He is truly, like Malachi said, he's truly the messenger of the covenant. God has sent the messenger. Boy, preaching of the gospel sure is better than preaching of Jonah. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't get a message like Jonah. Jonah didn't, Jonah didn't preach a message of repentance. They, pre they repented just perhaps. All he said was, city's being destroyed. We've got a much better message than that. The, preaching, the message of the gospel is much better than the message of, of the law, of Moses. That, that message was, if you do this, you'll live. The message of the gospel is, Jesus did this, and you'll live. <laughs> totally different. Jesus sent his disciples preaching. Not, he sent preachers. He didn't send a praise band. He sent preachers. It's through the foolishness of preaching that he saves them that believe. Not through the foolishness of praise and worship. It's through the foolishness of preaching. The preaching of the gospel will result in praise from God, but you can't get them backwards. The praise from God is not going to result in the gospel. The gospel does result in the praise, in the praise of God. Brother Givens mentioned in the past how that <clears throat> it used to be that when you walked into a church, you always saw the Lord's table and a pulpit, and now you're likely to see drums and a guitar. I'm not against drums and the guitar. I, I love music. David was a psalmist. I'm not, I'm not against music. I'm not at all. The, the, there's music in the kingdom of God. I'm talking about priorities. And the gospel, preaching the gospel, salvation, the eyes of the heart being enlightened, men reconciled to God, that produces praise. So praise is actually a fruit. People talk about praise being a portal. Praise is a fruit. And it results from the gospel, the gospel being preached. So I'm going to give you a few conclusions here. <clears throat> As we're running the race that is set before you, don't you agree that you need a little good news along the way? Or a lot of good news. You're running a race. It's demanding. We're not taking a stroll. We're running a race. We know what's at the, at the finish line, but we don't know where our finish line is. And you need some good news along the way. So here's, as you're running the race, here's some good news for you, brethren. In due time, we shall reap if we faint not. See, we need, some, we need some messages like that. What about the fight? Well, if you, you know, if you don't have some good news as you're fighting, you're going to end up beating the air. You're just going to go through the motions, just beating the air. But as you're, as you're fighting, it's needful to have some good news. Here's a, here's a good battlefield message. If we sow to the Spirit, we'll reap life everlasting. That's a good message to hear on the battlefield. But just one more. While you're resisting the devil, it's a good time to hear some good news. When the devil is after you, he seeks to devour. He's seeking those whom he may devour. So as you're, as you're resisting the devil, it's a good time to hear this. In a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So I exhort you, brethren, to keep fighting, to keep running, to keep, uh, to keep resisting. And the, 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 the news is only going to get better. You know, salvation is nearer than when we believed. I, did, we, I mentioned we don't know where, where the finish line is, but we do know it's closer. It's, it's, it's nearer than when we believed. So I, I exhort you, brethren, to keep your eye on the finish line.